It says uh, the energy in the body pitch uh, with respect to the time is always decreasing, which means it's always getting closer to what we want it to be. I, when I first showed up without a whole lot of a, you know, without a firm plan, I, there was a lot of wandering around in the desert is what Dan calls it, that, you know, took place before, before I started, you know, you, before I started realizing like, what, what am I actually doing here, you know, asking those sorts of questions. And once you ask them, then you're kind of open to the answer. It wasn't until really getting to work with uh, Avik and Gavin, who are two students in the lab who uh, graduated or nearly graduated, um, that I started to kind of develop my own vision for what I wanted to do here. And, you know, Avik and Gavin were always thinking about how do you integrate this, this long stream of controls. If you were to write or expose the controller that I'm running as a, as a human as I move through the world, what kinds of things are important? I don't know the physics of my particular contact mode. Is that embodied somewhere in my muscles? Is that in my spinal cord? Is that in my brain? And if you can stop and think about that kind of you know, wisdom or whatever, and then apply it to the robot when you're doing similar things, um, you'll, you'll have a good sort of starting place to, to start building these behaviors. So at the beginning, you know, it's pumping itself up. So there's some, like the way that you'd be on a swing set and you, you pump and it's getting higher and higher and higher. And there's a point that's too high, you know, when you get to the point on the swing where the, like, the chains go slack. So we're basically trying to find the equivalent of that. The, the real ways that you, you feel adversity, especially coming out of Dan's lab, is, you know, the, these other kind of data-driven methods sort of rose to the top and they're very much in vogue. And whether you're in academia or if you're in business, people really like to see them being present. And we are very far away from that um, in general. Uh, and that's okay. But I would say that's probably the most kind of like adversity that you really face is you just, you have the road to convincing somebody that your ideas aren't you know, outdated and are as good as or better than the stuff that, that everybody's talking about right now and everybody thinks is the kind of, this is going to be the future forever. Sometimes you just have a project you'll never finish um, or you'll have one that takes many, many months um, and you always feel like you should have done it faster. The answer is always so obvious in retrospect and you're very, very frustrated with yourself for not seeing it initially. And so, I mean, that, that's the thing I think that's the hardest part for me is to try and remember that it's like, okay, well, you didn't know ahead of time and it took this long and there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, here we are now and, and not allowing your image to, of yourself to change in the face of what feel like huge setbacks when in reality that's just the, uh, the time that it takes to, to do this. Yes, great work. Why do these circus tricks? because they're good sandboxes for ideas that I hope will become so well fleshed out and solid someday that people will have no choice but to use them on much more boring things that nobody will want to watch videos of. One cutting edge change, if applied to all of this existing stuff that isn't as exciting uh, on its face, um, can have like wide reaching uh, consequences and I'd, I'd like to be a part of something like that. So uh, I think, um, the places that are really kind of on the edge of this are our transportation, energy, uh, and doing something with that in the future would be really, I think, fulfilling just because you can change the quality of people's lives and you can help sort of preserve the planet.